engines today are crazy, stupid, powerful. How did we get 800 horsepower sedans and SUVs? Well, today we're breaking down the most powerful production engines ever put in cars. Welcome to Donut. Some people consider this car, the Pontiac GTO, the first muscle car ever. But other people, you know, nerds, will tell you that it was actually the Oldsmobile Rocket 88, which checks a lot of the same boxes. In the 1950s, Oldsmobile took a relatively small car and gave it the Rocket, a five liter double carb V8 that pumped out 135 horsepower. But they went even further with the J2 Golden Rocket package with an astounding 312 horsepower. That's insane for the time. Microwaves are barely a thing. And you're telling me this car can do a burnout? That's downright irresponsible. The overhead valve setup allowed the engine to breathe much better than older engine designs. But the real innovation that made that power possible was a triple carburetor setup. Under normal driving conditions, the engine was fed by the center carburetor alone to increase fuel efficiency. But when you put the hammer down, two more vacuum operated carburetors opened up, greatly increasing the amount of fuel and air going into the engine, making a little more power, baby. Fast forward a few years later and everything changes, which brings us to this, the Pontiac GTO. This was the brainchild of John DeLorean, who was in charge of Pontiac at the time. He actually defied his bosses at General Motors who banned the sale of racing vehicles by putting a 389 cubic inch V8 under the hood of the Pontiac Tempest and offering it as a dealer option. This loophole resulted in a power output of 325 horsepower. That's more than double the original Rocket 88's power at 135. And other car makers took note of what Pontiac was doing, which kicked off one of the most legendary horsepower wars in history. Just three years after Pontiac introduced the GTO, Chevy introduced the Camaro. The Camaro was introduced with the most famous version of the Chevy small block V8, the 350. In that car, it made about 300 horsepower and 380 foot pounds of torque. But over the years, Chevy started bumping up that power figure. 1970 saw the introduction of the LT1 small block in the Corvette and Camaro Z28. The Camaro got a 360 horsepower version, but the Corvettes put out 400. That's because GM had a strict rule that no other sports car they made could produce more horsepower than the Halo Corvette. I mean, that's your top car. You can't really have a lesser car. This is Angeles Crest Highway, one of the best driving spots in LA. And to drive the best, you've got to use the best. So today, we're running Extreme Contact Sport O2 tires from today's sponsor, Continental Tire. They'll give you ultra high performance on and off the track, and they're ideal for BMWs and Audis. The Extreme Contact Sport O2 tires give you superior handling and braking. It doesn't matter if it's wet or dry. Continental track tested these tires to go mile after mile, lap after lap. They're even equipped with tuned performance indicators. Check out the letters D and W molded into the tire tread. It's really simple. If the W disappears, then the tire is no longer optimal for wet conditions. If the D disappears, then the tire is no longer optimal for dry conditions and needs to be replaced. Do you want the perfect tire for both the street and the track? Then get a set of Continental Extreme Contact Sport O2 tires. To learn more, just click the link below. I'm gonna go drive more. The 454 is a 7.4 liter performance engine that was available in the Chevelle or even the El Camino. Yeah, your weird uncle's car. Chevy claimed this engine made 450 horsepower, but some people say it actually put out over 500 in a car that your uncle has. But Chevy wasn't the only company stuffing fat engines into small cars. Ford had developed another V8 called the FE or Ford Etzel. Over the years, this was put in everything from the Ford Galaxy to the Thunderbird to the Mustang GT. Versions of it were also used in the Shelby Cobra and the GT40. The FE V8 ranged in sizes from 330 cubic inch all the way to 429. But the one we all know and love is the 427, famously used in the Shelby Cobra 427. This beast made up to 485 horsepower and captured many boomer hearts in the process. Later, Ford dropped the Boss 429. This was an elite Mustang with a giant hood scoop beating that 429 cubic inch V8, or seven liter for all you Europeans out there. On paper, it produced 375 horsepower, but an incredible 450 
foot-pounds of torque. That's a lot of stumps you can pull. But when it was independently dynoed, it was said to make closer to 400 horsepower. While Pontiac and Ford were early to the market with the GTO and the Mustang, Dodge really went ham shortly after. And soon, the big three were battling it out, trying to make more horsepower than the rest. But who would win? When you think of Chrysler's contributions to the muscle car era, you probably think of the Hemi. Hemi is short for hemispherical, which refers to the shape of the top of the piston. Rather than flat, it was convex. As you can imagine, this led to some of the most powerful engines of this time. There are a bunch of formidable Mopar engines from this era, like the 360 and the 440, but the boss's hog of them all was the 426 Hemi. This hog was produced from 1964 to 1971, and it was nicknamed the Elephant because of its massive size and weight. Topping out at a full seven liters, the 426 started as a NASCAR engine, then went into production for homologation purposes. Chrysler claimed the 426 made 425 horsepower, but again, independent testers say it was closer to 494. Despite my love for the 426 though, there's one engine from this era that put down even more power. That's right. There's one engine that's more powerful and more rare than any of the other ones so far, Chevy's L88. This 427 cubic inch V8 was a special option available for the 1967 Corvette. They only made 216 of these things, and Chevy rated the L88 at just 435 horsepower. But when car and driver tested it, they found it made between 540 and 580 horsepower, Bruh. which is insane for a car of that time. Unfortunately for the muscle car though, they peaked right before the dreaded gas crisis. And soon after, companies nerfed their big engines to comply with environmental regulations. And what followed was more of a decade of dropping power as they scrambled to make engines more efficient. It wasn't just the environmental regulations, it was also the fact that gas got super expensive and these things got like eight miles to the gallon. Like not, not great, if we're being honest. So just like that, the horsepower war was over. At least it was in America. But elsewhere in the world, powerful engines were just getting started. Does the name Ferrari ring a little bell to you? Huh? It should, because, I mean, that'd be actually pretty crazy if you'd never heard of Ferrari. The Prancing Horse made its debut in 1947, and soon after, they were producing high-powered racing engines. Soon after that, those same engines made its way into road-going versions of those race cars that they were building. One of the most powerful Ferrari engines of the time was the Colombo V12. Named after the guy who designed it for Ferrari, Giacchino Colombo. They used variations of this engine for 40 years. But one of the most significant versions was the one that came in the 410 Super America. It was bored out to five liters, it had triple Weber carbs, which is what Joe has for breakfast every morning. The five liter Colombo V12 made a max of 395 horsepower in 1960. This was right around the time that a certain tractor manufacturer went in to give Enzo Ferrari a heads up that his car kinda sucked to drive. And this kickstarted a rivalry that produced some of the biggest and most powerful engines in the country of Europe. Before the Aventador, before the Diablo, before the Countach, Lamborghini was making screaming V12s that tore up the Stradales. One of the most badass versions of this legendary V12 was in the Lamborghini Mira SVJ. The displacement was just 3.9 liters and it made 440 horsepower. And even though this isn't as much as some of the American cars we've talked about, these European cars were super lightweight, mid-engine, and also a piccolo. I'm gonna get my ass kicked in Europe. Ferrari and Lamborghini would continue to battle for years, proving if that you were rich enough, you could afford a vehicle with tons of horsepower. And that's a theme with many of the high-powered European cars that came out over the next few years. With excess in styling also comes excess in performance. They go hand in hand. But over in Stuttgart, Germany, a little company called Porsche was able to make a lot of power from half the cylinders. Porsche developed a turbocharged 3.3 liter flat six engine that made 300 horsepower. And mind you, this is 1978, literally smack dab in the middle of both gas crises when American cars were lucky to be pushing 200. This thing was so wily that it was nicknamed the Widowmaker because of how hard it was to control. Like, so hard to control that you die and leave a widow behind. And maybe you have kids and they're left behind too, left to fend for themselves while well, you're down there and oh. These European sports cars evolved to be more powerful, more technologically advanced, and most importantly, way, way faster going into the 1980s. And that's when another war began. No, not the invasion of Granada, a speed war. 
a rivalry was born in the race to hit 200 miles per hour in a production car. It culminated with three truly iconic cars, the Ferrari F40, the Porsche 959, and the Roof CTR, aka the Yellowbird, based off a 911 Carrera, but technically belonging to an entirely different car company. If you want to know more about the Yellowbird, we actually did a video on it a couple years ago. It was the very first one built, 001. I can't believe that we got access to that thing. You can find it right there and down in the description after you watch this video. There's this hanging out in the car elevator. Joe was there, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. The futuristic all-wheel drive Porsche 959's 2.8 liter twin turbo flat six, that's a lot of numbers, made 444 horsepower. The Yellowbird's twin turbo 3.4 liter flat six made 463, and the Ferrari F40's 2.9 liter twin turbo V8 made 471. Just how close those power figures were to each other made the race to 200 that much more interesting. Oh, and if you're wondering, the Yellowbird won the race to 200, hitting 213 miles per hour on the Nardo ring. Uh, it's insane. However, Roof wouldn't hold that title for long. After just a few years, a little company called Bugatti introduced the EB110, a beautiful supercar with a quad turbo V12. That's four, quad means four. The EB110 took over the spot as the fastest production car thanks to its 553 horsepower. But Bugatti only held that title for a single year because the next year, the McLaren F1 shattered nearly every vehicle speed record. This British mid-engine center seat supercar had a BMW developed V12 called the S72. Unlike the four turbo Bugatti, the S70 had zero turbos, and yet it still managed to produce 618 horsepower. Somehow, this is the first car that makes more power than that Corvette from earlier, and it only took 30 years. That's insane, think about that. Let that sink in. Have you let it sink in yet? This recipe of super expensive luxury cars with high horsepower would continue to grow in Europe. But what about normal people? When will we guys like me get access to powerful cars again, huh? Well, that brings us to a little country I like to call Japan. Japanese car companies have been using turbos in production engines since the late 1970s, and that technology was advancing quickly. Coupled with the switch from carbureted engines to fuel injection, Japanese cars were not only becoming more reliable, but way more powerful. In fact, in the 1990s, a lot of people in Japan thought these engines were becoming too powerful. Growing concerns about car accidents and road safety and a little bit of street racing led to a bunch of Japanese executives getting together and making a pact that they wouldn't exceed 276 horsepower, at least on paper. These executives knew that they weren't actually gonna stop huh? making muscled up horse machines, but they just say the cars only had 276 horsepower to maintain a better public image. It's a little bit of a cold war over there. And that's why if you look at the spec sheets for Skyline GTRs, Supras, 300ZXs, and the Subaru 22B, they all make 276 horsepower. Imagine that, huge <laughs> uh, uh, spectrum of engine technology all make the same number. How is that possible? Well, it's not. For example, the Supra easily makes 320 horsepower with that big old 2JZ in it. And you know what? These things can be tuned to make even more power. It was like the American muscle car era all over again, this time in Japan. And luckily, America was also starting to get its mojo back around this time. In the late 90s, Chevy debuted the LS1 V8 in the C5 Corvette, like the one sitting behind me right there. Funny how that worked out. The normal version of that motor made around 350 horsepower, but the Z06 trim, like the one right here, made 405. It even has a badge on the side of that saying that. That's lower than the C2 Corvette made in the 60s, but it was definitely a step in the right direction. And as we know, the LS would go on to become one of the most universally swapped engines ever, and Chevy still continues to refine the engine today. Turned out Dodge liked the smell of whatever the heck Chevy was cooking over there in Detroit in the 90s, and also decided to jump back into the performance ring. The first gen Viper made 400 horsepower from an eight liter V10, and Dodge kept refining that to get more and more power over the coming years. So you can actually learn more about the Viper in this video right here. That was the best video I've ever freaking made. But Dodge didn't think the Viper should be the only performance car in their lineup. And that's when things started to get a little insane. As James put it in Up to Speed a few years ago, they threw a party at the end of the world, okay? They started stuffing massive V8s into anything and everything. It started with the Charger and Magnum SRT, which got a 6.1 liter Hemi making 425 horsepower. An American station wagon with over 400 horsepower had been unheard of for decades, but this was America's time for a little comeback. 
As we all know, Dodge continued to stuff bigger and wilder engines into their cars, like the Hellcat, a 6.2 liter supercharged Hemi, which made 707 horsepower when it debuted in 2015. But that was just the beginning. They took it a step further with the Demon, which thanks to an even larger supercharger was able to squeeze out 840 horsepower on race gas. That's insane. And that's almost nothing compared to the new SRT Demon 170. This little Hellraiser right here makes 1,024 horsepower. That's more than a Bugatti Veyron. What? I didn't even realize that until now. That's insane. I wonder what the warranty's like on that. And of course, Ford and Chevy, they've been throwing their hats in the horsepower ring for a few years now. The current Shelby GT500 makes 760 horsepower. I can tell you that thing is a hoot and the ZR1 Corvette is set to make 800 horsepower with an even more powerful one on the way. It's absolutely insane for cars to have this much power. Let's be honest, these things are still pretty normal. But what's absurd is what today's supercars are making. Take the Aston Martin Valkyrie, for example, which thanks to its Cosworth built, naturally aspirated 6.5 liter V12 makes 1,000 horsepower alone and revs to 11,000 RPM. Dude, you think VTEC is sick? Listen to this thing. <laughs> Pair that with an electric motor and you're making 1200 horsepower. But electric motors are not allowed on this list, so we gotta bump it back down to 1,000. That's right, 1,000, that's nothing. Now we got the insane W16 engine found in all Bugatti models. This quad turbocharged, four turbos, eight liter behemoth in the form of two V8s bondo together like this has grown from 1,000 horsepower in the early Veyron to an incredible 1,825 horsepower in the most powerful Bugatti, the Bolide. The penultimate engine on this list is one near and dear to our hearts. It's made by the Maniacs over at Hennessy, and you've probably read some news about them lately for a little car called the Venom F5. I've heard about this thing my whole life, I feel like. Under the hood, you'll find a 7.6 liter twin turbo V8 that produces a bananas 1,817 horsepower. Come on, guys. Let us know if you wanna see us drive this thing. I feel like I've heard about this car forever. I wanna see what it's got. So that brings us to the most powerful car on this list. The SSC Tuatara, powered by a twin turboed flat plane crank V8. That means it sounds sick. This engine was developed with help from Nelson Racing and produced 1,351 horsepower on pump gas. Okay, I know what you're saying, big deal. My mom's Camry does that. So, if you fill this thing with ethanol, you're looking at 1,750, okay? But, if you put methanol in this thing, yeah, that's right, the fuel that burns invisibly, it's scary. Put that in this thing, you're looking at 2,200 horsepower, more power than you ever need in your life. Good Lord, what are we doing? It's like when you think about the scope of the universe, you're like, I don't know how far a light year is. How far is 12 light years? It loses all, that's so powerful that power loses meaning. What the hell? So that does it for most powerful production engines. I hope we covered yours, and if we didn't, let us know your favorite engine down in the comments. You know, it kind of sucks that gas engines are kind of on their way out, but, you know, EVs are pretty dang fast, too. And as long as I can go fast, that's all I care about. So, I'll see you next time. Didn't know that there's so many stoplights so close together.